Welcome to Ignite. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Jared, and I get to serve this house as the community pastor. And if you've asked me anything about my job over the last year, year and a half, you would have heard this answer. I got the best job in the world. Y'all, I get to work with all of our local nonprofits. Um, I was in uh, Guatemala last week, two weeks ago. I'm gonna be back in Guatemala at the end of this week. Uh, We have so many amazing partners here at Ignite and I get to just uh, go and see and help them minister. It's an amazing job. I have, uh, I'm married. I'm married way out of my league. Uh, We've been married 17 years and I have four kids. And in my notes, it says I have four amazing kids, but come on parents, like they're amazing most of the time, right? Like that's kind of just how it, how it works, but it is, it's a beautiful thing. I'm also part of the teaching team here at Ignite and we get to fill in for Pastor Jason as he's on sabbatical. So last Sunday, can we just give it up for Pastor Jake who just did an amazing, amazing job last Sunday. And I get to step in today and talk to you about Romans chapter nine. Romans chapter nine is a really heavy, theologically rich chapter. And it finds itself in part of a a greater um, context here. Romans nine through 11, Paul is saying some really specific and direct things. And I just wanna encourage you as we do every Sunday, y'all, like don't take my word for it. Read Romans 9 through 11 this week and see just exactly what Paul is talking about. It would take me probably a long time to explain all of that. And so there are people way smarter than me. We have one of those on staff, our resident scholar, Pastor Mason. And uh, this is what he wrote about Romans 9 through 11 in his article, He says this, when we arrive at Romans 9, Paul is addressing the Jewish assumption that Jews automatically had a right to salvation by their heritage and through their ability to keep the Mosaic law. He also addresses the Jewish assumption that salvation was not available to the Gentiles. He builds on this in chapter 10 to discuss what one must do to receive salvation and to demonstrate the need to evangelize to the world. He concludes in chapter 11 with a warning to the Gentiles and hope for the Jews of being saved. One of the beautiful things about scripture is we can take this larger piece of of scripture and we can read through chapter nine and just see some incredible truths that Paul laid out for the the Israelites, the Jews of that time. And and I really think for us too. So I, I think as we read through this, you'll see a lot of similarities between the Jews that Paul's writing to and the church here in the South in 2024. You see, the Jews thought that they were okay, that their relationship with God was okay, because of who they were. They were, they were God's chosen. You know, they didn't have to do anything. The Jews thought they were okay because of what they kept. They kept the law. They did all the things. The Jews thought they were okay because of themselves and what they did. And Paul's addressing that and he was saying, no, you're not okay. It takes faith. And he's saying the same thing to us because so many times, like, don't we think we're okay? because our parents went to church. You know, how many times I've asked somebody to, I'm like, hey, what's your faith story? And they're like, well, you know, I've just always been in church. You know, like, I'm good. Like, they just, they, they think that that means something. And it's awesome to have a heritage. And we'll talk more about this later. But like, Paul's telling us the same thing that he was telling the Jews then. He's saying, it's all about faith. It's all about faith. And so he begins walking through this in Romans chapter nine. You know, and he's figuring out who is God? Who is God? So I went through what I call a mid-faith crisis about 10 years ago. Not a midlife crisis. This was way cheaper, by the way. I didn't have buy, go out and buy anything. I went through a mid-faith crisis about 10 years ago. I, I grew up in a Christian school, kindergarten, graduated from a Christian school, went straight to a Bible college. I was there five years Please don't make fun of me for that. Like, it did take five years. Uh, and, and I didn't even graduate, all right? Well, I don't know. It's a long story, another day. Uh, and, and, and then, like, my dad's a pastor. And so I just 
kind of like, I've always been in church. I've always known the answers. If you had a question about faith, they would say, call Jared, he'll know, right? I knew all the answers. I knew how to answer all the questions. But I didn't have this foundational truth about who is God. Because I had to decide for myself. So I'm driving down the road, doing what all good Christians do, listening to Christian radio. And so this song comes on the radio and I, like, I wish I was making this up. But I heard the first three lines of the song and I turned it off. And I'm like, why are we seeing this? Like, I'm smart. I, I'm a good Christian I know what kind of music needs to be on the radio and this was not it. Like, why would we be singing about this? So I I turned the radio back on next time I got in the car and a few days later, I heard the song again. And I listened to a little bit more and then I turned it off. Well, four or five, y'all know Christian radio plays the same song every 20 songs, right? I was in it, I know. So, uh, So eventually, this song started seeping into me. And I, and I wanna read the words, the first few lines of this song, it says this. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you are, but I've heard the tender whispers of you in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. I'm like, we're supposed to be singing about God's holiness and about God's power and he's a consuming fire and all these things. Like, how can we be singing? He's a good, good father. I gotta figure this out, Lord. Who are you? So for the next year, year and a half, that's that just every minute of that I was studying the scripture was in that topic. And I found some beautiful truths at the end of it and it's really helped shape the, the, the back part of my life that I have a firm foundation about who God is. And so this morning, my, my prayer for you is that you'll, you'll understand a little bit more about who God is. I mean, let's be honest. I could, we could preach every Sunday for the next two years and not totally encompass who God is. But this morning, I, I do. I, I want you to ask yourself the question, who is God? God to me. Let's pray one more time and then we'll hop into the the sermon. Father, you are good. And we just got to celebrate people going from death to life, people making a declaration that they were once dead in their sin and that now they're alive in Christ. And what a beautiful thing it was to watch. Your word, your truth transforms lives. And so I pray that this morning, that is what would come, that your word, that your truth would would come and that that it would challenge us and that it would transform us and it would make us more like you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you haven't already, go ahead and pull out your Ignite Church app. We have um, just a, a, a word today about who is God. Who is God? Um, We're going to start in Romans 9, as Paul does, verses 1 through 3. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and increasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. So before we jump into like the, 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 attributes of God that we see here in Romans 9. I want you to hear what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I have seen who God is. I have had a real life encounter with Jesus Christ. And he is so good and so overwhelming and so majestic that I would would trade in my own salvation if it meant that you the readers would in turn be saved. Like that's the kind of God that that Paul knew. He was so powerful and so amazing that Paul was willing to risk his own salvation so that other people would hear and would know. He kind of gave me a gut check this week about, like 
Am I willing, like how, how willing am I to tell others about Jesus? Whereas Paul was willing to lay his own salvation on the line. A.W. Tozer says this in one of his most popular quotes, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So Paul is challenging the modern thinking of that time. He's challenging them to know who God is. And I think he's challenging us today. Like who is God to the American churchgoer? Who is God to the person who thinks they're good enough? Who is God to us here at Ignite? Questions that we have to answer. And Paul tells us a few things about the true one and only God. So the true one and only God, number one, is justified in all that he does. The true one and only God is justified in all that he does. Romans 9, 14 says this. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. So in, in the four or five verses leading up to Romans 9, 14, Paul is taking the Jewish people on this 23 and me journey. It's like, I'm not gonna ask for a, a, a hand raise, but like y'all 23 and me or whatever we're doing here to figure out our, our ancestry, like it's so popular right now. And, and it makes me be like, man, I really wish I knew like my ancestry. I tried, but I wasn't willing to pay for anything. And so I got like my dad. I'm like, I already knew who my dad was, you know? It just was what it was. So yeah, but Paul is taking the Jewish people here down this walk. And he starts with Abraham and he reminds them of Abraham. And then he reminds them of Isaac. And he reminds them of Jacob. And Paul says to them, hey, it's not about you. It's all about God. Like you think that you're the special person, but I want you to hear that God's the special person, that it's, he is the center of it all, not you. And in our culture today and in our lives today and in my mind today, so often, like, I'm the center of it. There's a saying in my house that ashamedly they say about me often, and it is this, it's dad's world, we're just living in it. <laughs> And when they say that, I'm like, yes, it is, you know? But like when my wife says, it's Jared's world, we're just living in it, like I have to take a step back and think, oh, okay, I'm not really the center of the universe. I'm not really the center of everything. And Paul is addressing this belief with the Jews that they were it, that, that they were what was so special and that if God was only going to do something, he was only going to do it through them and not through anybody else. I'm thankful this morning that I'm in anybody else and I'm thankful that they were wrong. And Paul's telling him like, I'm not telling you that you have to understand everything, but I'm telling you that you have to get in your minds and in your heads and in your heart that it's all about God. That it's all about God. You see, up until the, uh, the late 1500s, the, the popular belief or the, the only belief really was that the earth was at the center of the universe, right? Seems silly to us, but to them, like, they had the Bible. They had all of these people who were so smart. Like God created the heavens and the earth. Like the earth is what is so special. The earth is what is the central point. The earth is the core of everything. Everything that happens revolves around the earth. And it's this, this assumption that was proven incorrect in the late 1500s. And you know what they did when the scientists came forward and said, hey, you know what? Like, like I, think, I think we've got it wrong. I think everything revolves around the sun. They put them in jail and they excommunicated them from the church. And they said, oh no, we'll have none of that talk. Like, we're it. It's all about us. And, and as they studied it more and more, you know, the really cool thing, it's like, it's like a, a 
tether, it's like playing tether ball, right? And so you have the sun up here and there's this giant string that's attached to it and, and the earth is here. And so the gravitational pull of the sun keeps the earth going. If the sun ceases to exist, then the earth continues to go on whatever path it was going. If it was going this way, it goes that way. If it's going this way, it goes that way. Whatever way it's going, it just keeps going because there's nothing to pull it back. There's nothing to rein it in. In my life, watch this. The S-O-N, if he's not at the center, there's nothing to rein me in. I just keep going down the path that I think is best. And there's no... There's nothing to pull me back. And so I'm thankful that that I know that he's at the center of it, that he's at the center of my life and that his world doesn't revolve around me. My world has to revolve around him. And watch this. If my world revolves around him, then everything he does is good. Everything he does is good is purposeful. And I might not see it and I might never know it, but if I'm truly revolving around Jesus, I have to understand I may never know the answer. I might never know, but I have to trust him because the true one and only God is justified in all that he does. So who is God to you this morning? Does he revolve around you? Is it my time and my money and my life and my job? Do I, do I get offended when I walk through the building of a church and nobody says hi to me? And I'm like, can't believe nobody said hi to me, right? Like this happens, like to me sometimes. Like I'm like, I can't believe nobody said hi to me. What is this, right? I'm like, oh, I should know better, right? Like we have to let go of this idea that we are it, And we have to just put our arms around the idea that God is justified in all that he does and that our world has to revolve around him. So not only is the true one and only God justified in all that he does, but number two, he is not obligated to show the same mercy to all. Romans 9, 15 through 16 says this, for he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. Paul's giving the Israelites here a lesson on mercy that, man, it is hard. It's a hard lesson. Like, I just want you to hear that. Paul's telling them, "Mm -mm. God gets to decide where he's gonna show mercy. God says, I'll show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Like, not you. You don't get to decide who gets mercy and who doesn't. I think in our lives, in our world, it shows up in a couple of different ways, okay? So two examples that, I, that I've, it shows in my life is the first, I just wanna say, if my neighbors are watching online, like, this ain't about you, I promise. It's just an illustration, okay? Uh, my great neighbors. But let's just say that I had bad neighbors on this side. And, and, and these neighbors, man, they just, they kept to themselves. They stole my cable. They, they plugged their faucet up to my, fa- or their hose up to my faucet and watered their lawn. Like they, their, the grass was higher than the cars. Like they never let me borrow anything. When they did borrow something, they never gave it back. Like they were just like bad neighbors. I think we would all agree that they're bad neighbors. And then on the other side, I have these neighbors. And man, they come over to the house. He has every tool I'll ever need and he knows how to use them so I don't have to worry about it. Like sugar, I get, eh, whatever I can eat, they got, right? Their yard is immaculate. Uh, When I'm on vacation, they'll cut my grass or they'll, they'll come and get my mail. And they're just, they are good people and they are good neighbors. So when we're having church on Sunday, which neighbor am I more likely to invite? the good neighbor, because they're already good. And man, if I can just get them to church a little bit, like they'll catch a little Jesus and things will be really good. But man, like I, I ain't talking to them. It's a bad neighbors. 
right? And, and Paul is telling the Jews here, like, you don't get to decide who's good and who's bad. You don't get to decide who makes it to heaven and who doesn't. God is merciful and he's the one who gets to decide who he's gonna show mercy on and who he's gonna show compassion on. You don't get to say so in the matter. Another thing I think it does for me is, is say that, that you and I have the same job, okay? And we work 40 hours every week. We, do, we, we are both equally awesome at our jobs. And at the end of every work week, the boss comes in and he hands you a check for $1,000 and he hands me a check for $1,000, which after bills and taxes, like I get two bucks, right? Like it's just how it is. But so once one Friday, he comes in, he hands me my envelope. I open it up. There's $1,000 in there. High five. Let's go. Payday, baby. And then he hands my, he hands you one. He hands my coworker one. And they open the check and there's $1,000 in there. All right, let's go. And then he says this, what's this? And he pulls out another check for $1,000. Oh, my immediate thought is not like, oh man, that's so awesome. My immediate thought is, where's mine? Where's mine, Mr. Boss? Like, you gave it to him, you owe it to me. Oh, oh, oh. no, no. I agreed to work 40 hours and get $1,000. You agreed to work 40 hours and get $1,000. But he just gave you a little extra this week. Just gave you a little extra this week. Paul is telling, again, us, the Jewish people of that time, right? you don't get to make this decision. God is going to show mercy to the Gentiles. They are going to receive salvation. And you don't need to be jealous. You need to be high-fiving somebody and thanking them for the goodness of God. And so this morning, church, like, who is God to you, I ask again? Is he somebody that owes you something? Oh, man, I prayed this week. Things are going to go good for me today. Like, I used to think, honest to goodness, when I was in high school, I'm like, man, like, I didn't do anything bad this week. I didn't say any bad words. I didn't lie. I didn't cheat on a test. I prayed. Like, I should have a good basketball game. God owes that to me. And that trickles down into our spiritual walk. And we start looking at God as somebody who owes us something. And Paul is telling them and us, you got to get your eyes off of that. God owes us the mercy of, of Jesus. And that's it. And so don't be jealous. And it's so hard. So this morning, like, who is God? Is he somebody who owes you something? Or is he someone you owe everything to? All right. The true one and only God, not only is he justified in all that he does, not only is he not obligated to show the same mercy to all, but point three, the true one and only God is chiefly committed to his own deserved glory. Verses 22 through 24 say this. And what if God wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory on us, the ones he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So if I'm being totally honest here, the first time I read this, I was like, what? <laughs> what does he say here? And, and, and the word of God can be confusing sometimes. And here's one of the beautiful things about the word. Like, it explains itself. And so I want us to go back and walk through these, these few verses. It says this, and what if God, it's like what if, like just what if God wanted to display his wrath and make his power known? Like God sees sin and he hates it. And he wants to like display his wrath on it. And he wants to make his power known. What if God wanting to do that endured with much patience, objects of wrath prepared for destruction? Okay, let me ask us a question this morning. Apart from Jesus, who would we say is destined for a life of destruction? Me, all of us, right? So, so Paul says, hey, what if God wanted to show his wrath and wanted to show his power. But he endured with much patience. Me. 
And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy, me, that he prepared beforehand for his glory? And then Paul stops and he says this, on us, the ones he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. God is not okay with your sin, period. There is no excuse. There is no hiding. There is no nothing that keeps God's wrath. Like God hates your sin. But you know what? Sometimes I don't think he hates my sin quite as much as he hates other people's sin. Sometimes I think that he's okay if I, if I have a good life, if I tell people about him, and if I keep these couple things in the back. I'm just gonna tuck them away nice and pretty. He'll never know. He'll never care. But I need you to hear this morning that God hates sin. God wanted to display his wrath and his power, but he was so patient because he wants us, his objects of mercy, to realize what he did for us. It's such an amazing thought to think that God did that for us. So I ask you this morning, like, who is God to you? Is he someone who's okay with your sin? Is he someone you can flippantly disobey? Is he a God that's okay with your sin? Or is he a God who is patiently waiting for you and me and mercifully wanting to make us more like himself? I know it's been a hard message. I know that that it's a deep, thick message. And, And when Pastor Jason gave this chapter to me, I was like, slid it back to him. (laughs) I gotta get up there and tell them this. I wanna talk about love and joy and peace. I wanna talk about the good things. But I get to end with the best thing. The best thing. Because the true one and only God not only is justified in all that he does, not only is he not obligated to show the same mercy to all, not only is he chiefly committed to his own deserved glory, but the one true and only God is genuinely impacted by our faith. Romans 9, 30 through 32 says this, what should we say then? Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were, by works. So I want you to imagine the shock and awe here that the Jewish person was hearing, the Israelites were hearing Paul say this, like, you don't, you don't have faith. You don't have eternity with Jesus. You don't have a hope. I I know you've been chasing and I know that you have been trying to, to keep all the laws. And I know that you go to synagogue and church when you're supposed to. And I I know that you do this and I know that you do that. And I know who your father was. He was Abraham. and, and, And I know that. But without faith, you're not getting there. And he says this, but Gentiles, but us who weren't even pursuing it. We didn't even know how good God was. Jesus shows up and draws us to him. And we, by faith, get to see that. And now we have the opportunity to place our faith and hope in him. This is how it relates to me in my life, okay? My dad is a pastor. I already told you that. I have 
two cousins who are pastors. My grandfather um, was, he, he preached. He was a Sunday school teacher, amazing heritage. My great-grandfathers, both pastors. My great-great-grandfathers, pastors. My second cousins are pastors. And so on and so on. But when I stand before Jesus, he's not gonna ask me who my great-grandfather was. He's not gonna ask me if my parents took me to church. He's not gonna ask me if I have a Bible at my house. He's gonna say, do you know me? And it's the, the beauty and the agony here, the beauty that it's so simple placing my faith in total surrender to him and the agony because I can't get there on my own and I want to so bad. I try so hard, but I just can't without total surrender to him. So how can you trust in a God who is justified in all that he does, who shows mercy to whom he wants to, who, who is chiefly concerned with his own glory. Like how, how do I know that I can trust this God? Because God is so committed to his sovereignty. Because God is so committed to showing mercy and so committed to his own glory that he watched his son die so that we could have life eternal. So I ask you one final time, Ignite. Who is God to you? Have you been playing around with his mercy and his grace? Are you trying to earn your way in? Do you think that you're okay because there's a Bible in your house or you went to vacation Bible school seven times every summer? Or have you put your faith and trust in Jesus. I'm gonna pray. And, and when I pray, I'm gonna ask you to respond. I'm gonna ask you to respond to the gospel. And, and here's a couple of different ways that you can respond. Our prayer and care team are gonna be uh, at both sides of the auditorium. And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, mm, I don't know this God. I do not know God. And this morning, Jared, if you're telling me that this is all true, that there's a God who, who loves me so much that he gave his son and he, he is like, like, I don't need to be the center of my universe anymore. I keep messing it up. And I wanna let go. And I wanna surrender to that God. Would you, would you, when I'm praying, would you come find one of our prayer and care team members? Let them show you through the word of God how you can know that God. Or maybe you're here and you would be like, hey, high five, Jared, good message. I'm good though. I came to church three weeks ago. Hey, my mom raised me in church. My grandma drug me by my ear every time the doors were open. I'm okay. And maybe this morning, the Holy Spirit is working on your heart a little bit and he's saying, there's more to the Christian life than just being okay. And you need to, to take that next step of, of total surrender. God, I don't wanna keep any hidden sin from you. I don't wanna keep anything in my life that you don't know about. I want you to have it all. I want you to have it all. I want you to change the way I think. I want you to change the way I act. I want you to change the way I parent. I want you to change the way I work. I just, like, I just need you. So as I pray this morning, don't wait and then stand up as we dismiss and walk out the door and be like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm gonna come next week. Right. Respond today if the Holy Spirit is drawing you to himself. Father, in Jesus.